Hi everyone, I'm Megan Warren, and this is Me Reimagined, a space where we unlock the frozen parts of ourselves, the parts we hide from and hide from the world, so we can learn to believe we're enough. In today's episode, we're going to be deep diving into the idea of forgiveness and how that relates to the not enough feeling. Originally, this was not the place I was going to start. I was going to start with credibility and the need to prove because it's been such a continual part of my own journey. But as I was working through one of my not enough patterns, which I'll break down with you later in this episode, it became clear that a major roadblock to releasing this pattern was self-forgiveness. Interestingly, this is a concept that I explore in one of my YouTube videos. And out of all of the videos I've made, it's gotten the most traction. I'll put the link for that video in the show notes so that you can find it after the episode. Now, I imagine that a question that may already have come up for you is why? Why exactly would you need to forgive yourself? You didn't cause yourself to feel not enough. It was in reaction to someone or a circumstance, right, that made you feel like you, you yourself, just as you were, as you are, was not enough, is not enough. So why would you be forgiving yourself? Well, I broke down my own journey, and I found eight reasons why I need to forgive myself. And while the details of the story are mine, the themes, the patterns, the feeling of not enoughness, those headlines are universal. I'll be interested to hear as I go through who else has experienced these themes. In fact, I almost wish this was a live medium so I could see your reactions come through in real time. But I look forward to continuing the conversation in the comments. Or you can leave me a voice note. Now, because I love to read, I decided to tell you my self-forgiveness journey in the form of a story with eight jaw-dropping chapters. Jaw-dropping because I think you'll see yourself in a few places. And maybe you'll realize that you too could do some self-forgiving. And because some of the things that we learn to believe, well, they're just unbelievable when you look back at them from a place of abundance. And I also decided to use the story form because stories are compelling. And I want my story to inspire you, to help you see that forgiving yourself, it's a good idea. So that by the end of the eight chapters, you see what's in it for you if you do forgive yourself and what it looks like on the other side of forgiveness. And then lastly, I want the story to show you that if I, someone (laughs) who's so entangled in her own worthlessness and story of lack, if I can do it, you are also capable of forgiving yourself. And in this episode, we're going to listen to chapter one, and then there are some questions in a worksheet that will help you navigate your own story of self-forgiveness. Chapter One, The Blame Game Once upon a time, there was a little girl. She liked ice cream, climbing trees, reading, and roller skating. Though the skating came later, because (laughs) the first time I put skates on, I thought I was going to swoosh and roll and twirl and turn like a swan princess. Needless to say, red face and screaming at the top of my lungs that the skates were broken, I demanded to know why I'd been given broken skates. But this little girl discovered early, like most little girls, that when she voiced disagreement, when she expressed a need, when she didn't feel like squeezing herself into the box of acceptable behaviors, that she was too much. And being too much was dangerous. Dangerous because when she did any of these behaviors, the thundercrack of her parents' disapproval broke over her head. And being at the mercy of a raging storm is not a safe place to be. So the girl took shelter, shelter in being good, keeping her head down, in doing what she was told, in not having opinions on topics or adopting other people's opinions. Shelter in not having needs. Shelter in perfectly acceptable behavior. When I think about it now, I get an image of the movie of the Stepford Wives. I was a Stepford child, and I I think I later became a Stepford wife. 
perfect gel nails, always groomed. You know, a friend in my early 20s told me that I was looking more and more like Barbie, though (laughs) given my flat chest and how short I am, it was a bit of a joke. But when she said it, she didn't mean it as a compliment. And now, looking back, I can see that with the physical alterations, I was trying to erase the natural me and mold it into a plastified perfection, I guess. Thank God that even though the the outside had been remolded, the inside was still as messy as ever. As much as I tried, those bloody needs would not go away. And really, I think that my saving grace was the internal chaos. It prevented me from abandoning myself to become a plastic doll. But let's get back to the story. When her parents got divorced, the girl's perfectly acceptable behavior strove for perfection. Even though her parents were clear that the divorce had nothing to do with her, the girl felt a need to make it okay for her parents. She tried to absorb their grief through perfection. If she could be good enough, maybe it would make it all okay. Maybe that she hadn't been good enough before. I mean, she always complained about her chores, she didn't always eat her broccoli, and she had thrown the skates down instead of saying thank you. So maybe that was the reason her father didn't live with them anymore. Despite the shelter of the good girl's good behavior, the girl's parents were sad and distant. She couldn't reach them. And so the girl was left with these horrible needs. She dragged them around in tiny suitcase, suitcases, which got in her way and made her really irritable and clumsy. Whenever one of the suitcases would get too full and split open, Whatever the girl needed, reassurance, to be seen and acknowledged, to be considered, to have affection, for sensitivity. Well, it would overwhelm whoever was with her. And instead of looking at what had spilled out of the suitcase, the person would start stuffing the needs back into the suitcase in any old haphazard way because it needed to be put away as quickly as possible. The girl always noticed that they looked around to see if others were noticing, because her behavior and her suitcases reflected poorly on them. On a side note, all of the needs that the girl had were valid and are universal. They are things that everyone needs. In fact, if you ever take a nonviolent communication course, you'll get a list of universal needs that you can use to orient the conversation away from shame and blame toward connection, around needs, needs that we all share. It's an absolute game changer, and it shifts arguments that you seem to be having over and over. (laughs) Of course, it takes a lot of practice, so I'll put a link in the show notes to my trainer, Carolyn Davies, who is amazing. She makes it fun. And still on the side note, let's be clear that all of the little girl's physical needs were met right? She was well-fed. She experienced physical safety. She was warm. She always had clothing and a roof over her head. The needs that we're talking about are the emotional needs, and those are the needs she stuffed into suitcases. But back to the story. The strategy the girl used whenever one of the suitcases would bust open was to castigate herself for not managing the suitcase well, for even having the suitcase at all. Why could she not just lose them somewhere? Leave them by a park bench for stray dogs to pee on. Because she couldn't get rid of the suitcases, and they were getting in her way, she hated the disapproval and alienation she felt when she lost control of one. She began to believe if she was stronger, maybe she could carry them better. If she was smarter, she could figure out how to get rid of them. If she was prettier, maybe she could have convinced someone else to take them on. If she was better, maybe they wouldn't be so heavy or bust open so much, and then she wouldn't feel so bad inside. In fact, she got angry at herself. If she was different, maybe she wouldn't have these suitcases. And as the suitcases were filling up, the little girl came to a fork in the road on her journey. Other kids went down the right fork in the road, and they blamed others. This little girl went down the left fork in the road. She blamed herself. And this blame later turned to shame as the suitcases got heavier, and the girl felt even more powerless to get rid of them. 
and even later, her perfectionist inner critic brought her to a place of self-loathing, having reiterated time and time again that the suitcases were evidence of her lack of strength, proof of her cringy neediness. She didn't add up to enough. That's the end of chapter one, The Blame Game. So now, I have two questions for you at the end of this chapter. The first is, what are your unmet emotional needs? Do you need to matter? Do you need to play or to be inspired? Do you need affection or touch? That last need reminds me, I once surprised myself and a massage therapist by crying during a massage, but it had been so long since anyone had intentionally touched me with softness and comfort, and the sadness spontaneously welled up. But that's my first question. What are your unmet emotional needs? I would love to hear what they are. I'll add the list of universal needs in the show notes. You take a look. You let me know in the comments or on a voice note what needs you have that are not getting met. Part of the power in this is sharing. And the other part is seeing that you're not alone. There's a whole community out there who also struggle with this. Now, my second question is when you have an unmet need, and man, those hurt. Do you blame others or do you blame yourself? Or maybe it's a bit of both. For me, it was, it was definitely a back and forth. But almost always, I ended up with me in the end because you can't change the other person. <laughs> Though not for lack of trying. I'm pretty sure that my former husband will attest to the truth of that because God knows I tried. Poor man, I used on him all the tricks that were used with me and which I used on myself. The shame, the blame, the criticism, the wounded victim. I was good at that one. The anger, the ignoring, the what? The armoring up. I'll show you I don't need you. The binge shopping. But when none of that changed the situation, the feeling of powerlessness would drive me back to the idea that it was my fault because that was the way I could control the situation. Because it was my fault that I had the need in the first place, I actively began to dislike the small inner child with all her needs shouting for help. I cut off all communication with her. She was bad and should be punished. Now, self-punishment is covered in one of the other seven chapters, so stay tuned. So who do you blame? Since this episode is about self-forgiveness, we're not going to cover blaming others right now. For those of you who blame yourselves, if you internalize the unmet need as bad, and what I mean by bad is that you could have a normal and universal need for, let's say, attention and connection, but since they're not available, you internalize the feeling that you are needy. God, ugh, what a horrible word that is. Even just the word evokes a clinging, helpless, grasping, I don't know what you'd call it, essence, but it's shameful. And Whenever I used to apply the word needy to myself, it always made me think of Gollum in Lord of the Rings. Oh, my precious. I mean, can you imagine what that does to your spirit if you picture yourself as Gollum every time you have a need? But let's, let's bring some awareness to this in your life. Do you blame yourself for the unmet need that you identified in my first question? And if so... What is the feeling that you internalize from that? So I'm going to give you two more examples here so it's really clear how this works. For example, let's say you said, yes, I have a need or had a need. I needed to be inspired. But let's say you shared that need. I mean, I think most kids say, I'm bored. <laughs> Did you ever hear the response that only boring people are bored? And then basically you were left to your own devices because it's not a parent's job to entertain you. So maybe you were bored in childhood or maybe lonely. If you weren't able to resolve this and you weren't shown how to inspire yourself or structure meaning in your life, then the feeling that you weren't able to alleviate is present with you every day. 
And because of its constancy in your life, it actually becomes in your mind a part of you, a character trait, a part of your identity. So maybe instead of feeling bored or lonely, needing to be inspired, you you actually began to think of yourself as boring or at least not very creative. And then from there, basically, it ends up having a major influence on your behavior and your outcomes. You didn't end up learning a way to inspire yourself or a way to structure meaning in your life as a child. So maybe you then turn to binging Netflix or video games instead of painting and selling the paintings on Etsy as a side hustle that gives you joy. 48 hours of Netflix or a beautiful painting that you were in flow when you produced and brings in extra cash. That's a big difference in a life if that pattern keeps getting repeated over and over. Now, this is a simple and small example, but I give it to show that there are huge consequences for your self-concept and the choices that you make related to how you see yourself. How much more innovative, creative, inspired, or satisfied would I think the whole world be if we all felt creative and learned at a young age how to inspire ourselves? But who here was ever really shown how to do that? Because there absolutely is a process for it. But let's take a look at another example. Maybe you needed autonomy or to be considered. As a child, did you experience change? Let's say your parents divorced, or you moved houses, or you changed schools. Or maybe you were given a haircut or clothes that you didn't have a choice in. I know a lot of boys who walked around with a bowl cut. You know, that bowl was put on their head and the hair was just trimmed to to meet the bowl. But let's say, I don't know, maybe you were signed up for activities without being consulted. Whatever it was, maybe it led to your needs for autonomy and consideration being unmet. So I experienced a few of these events, and I didn't feel any sense of autonomy in the situation. And I think these are very common, right? But for the child, it resulted in an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of frustration. And one result of the frustration, for me at least, was a learned helplessness. I didn't see myself in the driver's seat. Others were driving. I was the passenger. And as a child, I complained a bit, but I never rebelled. I accepted that as fate. But fast forward that. Learned helplessness means that for a very long time, I was making decisions based on what I should do, what others recommended, rather than considering what I wanted or needed. I had absorbed that frustration into my bones, and it transmuted from a feeling into a sense of identity. I was a follower. I could make choices, but only within the structure that was given to me. The very idea that I could break out and go my own way seemed like a tall tale. Of course, the overachiever that I am, I mastered the shit out of following. <laughs> I mean, I always worked my way up, but that was by following the leader's instructions to a T. And you know, eventually my spirit got too restless within that system. And there was a question that I exiled, but it didn't matter. It still pounded in my head. And it asked, isn't there something more than this? And once that question worked its way into my feet, I had trouble making myself get off the tram to go into work. And in that moment, I realized that my boat was drifting down the river, but I wasn't directing it. And once I started to direct it, to seize my autonomy, my choice, to consider myself, my life changed dramatically, and it is still changing. So my question for you is, how would your life change if you separated the feeling of the unmet need from your character? What if it wasn't a personality trait? You are not needy. You're not boring or helpless. You are a person with valid needs who felt or feels those things. And what if this pattern of turning an unmet need into a character trait 
was a beautiful coping mechanism, those trying to protect you from pain. I'll put a link in the show notes to a worksheet that you can download and use to bring some awareness to this pattern of internalized feelings. Now, we covered a lot, so I'm going to quickly recap just to make sure it's clear. You are exploring whether you need to forgive yourself. You may need to forgive yourself because in the moment that you had an unmet need, you blamed yourself, thinking that you should be better or more in some way. And at a time when you most needed support, you did not support yourself. And you internalized a narrative about how you are deficient in some way. And that narrative is shaping your life right now. Sometimes this is easier to see if you replace yourself with a friend. So your friend, let's say your inner friend, had has a valid need. And instead of helping her or him fulfill that need, you're telling them a story about how they're deficient, how they're not enough. What kind of friendship is that? To take that further, what kind of friendship do you want to build with yourself? Do you want to be able to comfort yourself, to rely on yourself? Do you want to trust yourself to have your own back, like you would in a, a strong and healthy friendship? Do you want to be able to see and believe that you are doing your best, that you are not deficient, that you are making choices from a space that trusts that you are enough, that you are capable, that you can meet your needs? That is what is on the other side of self-forgiveness. Now, I would love to see us share our patterns because the first step towards getting yourself into the driver's seat of your life, driving in the direction of enoughness, is to shift the patterns from unconscious behaviors to conscious behaviors, to actually understand what's happening and then intentionally forgive yourself for it. And if you can't forgive yourself, let this community help you. If you, if you think you're broken or irreparable, give us a synopsis of the situation in the comments. Leave a voice note. Let us find your humanity and mirror back how you are normal, whole, magnificent, and that you just, you have a valid unmet need that deserves compassion. And if in the worksheet you find you can't figure out what the need is or the character trait the need morphs into, drop me a line, leave me a voice note on the podcast, put a comment in the box, and we'll take it offline. I'll help you figure it out. So I always close with gratitude, and I am feeling so grateful for the sense of purpose that I feel now, how intentional my life feels when I share with this community. I feel grateful for my partner because our relationship has been a big playground in which to practice feeling enough because he helps provide opportunities, which I don't always love, <laughs> but he provides a safety to do so. I feel grateful for my stepdaughter who last night opened up about something that hurt her and she let me have the most amazing opportunity to comfort and reassure her. Hugging her felt like such a gift. I feel grateful for this community, all of you out there listening and doing your best. You are magnificent. Together we are melting our frozen parts and changing our relationship to ourselves, to others, and to the whole world. So what are you thankful for? What uplifts you today, especially if you're in a difficult period? Sharing what you're grateful for well, it shifts your focus, and for the moment, you feel better. And sharing the love, others receive that, and they feel better. It's like a big hug. So to close this episode, I want to remind you of the questions that we asked. What are your unmet emotional needs? Leave a comment. Tell me about them. Join the conversation. Let this community hold a little space for you. And when you have an unmet need, do you blame others or do you blame yourself? If you blame yourself, how do you internalize that? 
When you think of the need, the unmet need, finish the phrase, I am a person who. Now, if you want to really dig into those questions, go to the show notes and download the list of universal needs and the worksheet that can help you untangle this pattern. And I just want to reiterate that you can untangle this pattern. It's a way of thinking and acting, both of which are things that you do, not things that you are. You are not deficient. You are not broken. You are magnificent, just as you are. The world needs you. Your unique, energetic imprint is contributing ripples, and they're shaping the world even if you can't see it. If you found this episode interesting or useful, subscribe to hear the other seven jaw-dropping episodes on self-forgiveness. Don't forget to share the worksheet. Send it to a friend who might need to forgive themselves. Spread the freedom. You can find all episodes of Me Reimagined on MeganWarrenCoaching.com. And if you leave a comment or a voice note, I'll reply. With love, until next time. You do not carry this all alone. No, you do not carry this all alone. This is way too big for you to carry this on your own. So you do not carry this all alone. You do not carry this all alone. No, you do not carry this all on your own so you do not carry this all alone you do not carry this all Carry this all alone.